So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another awesome Authors at Google Talk. Um, today, we're particularly honored to host Ibu Patel. Now, as part of the uh, Campus Honors Program at the University of Illinois, uh, the Urbana Champaign, the name Ibu Patel is always displayed prominently on our walls. It's sort of a myth and legend thing as, as we progress through the program. Um, someone larger than life. And that's, um, to a certain extent, who Ibu is. He's always striving for the greater good. Um, he found his calling through the promotion of interfaith dialogue, making the interfaith conversation as, as important and relevant as the environmental con um, conversation, the social justice conversation. And he's found his particular outlet on, on college campuses, which is a, tr a traditional um, area for, for discussion and, and, and an understanding. And I Ibu's team has made a big impact in, in terms of um, fostering interfaith dialogue on college campuses. Now, his work does reach beyond the college campus and the university. He serves currently on the board of President Obama's Religious Advisory Committee, and he, um, he writes regularly for the Washington Post in a, a blog that deals with um, interfaith issues. Um, it's um, entitled The Faith Divide. Um, today, he'll be speaking to us about his work through his nonprofit, which is the Interfaith Youth Corps, and as well as his book, uh, his book, which is entitled Acts of Faith, The Story of an American Muslim, The Struggle for the Soul of a Generation. Now, Ibu has many titles and awards, from being a, a Rhodes Scholar to an Ashoka Fellow to a member of the, the National Committee for the Agra Khan Foundation. Um, he's one of the social entrepreneurs to watch on our, our nation's stage, um, but, th but his true merit lies in his impact and work. Um, by fostering interfaith dialogue, um, Ibu helps make the world truly a better place. So we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, feel free to use the, the mics, and otherwise, please join me in welcoming Ibu to Google. Thank you. Well, thank you to my fellow Illini, Cliff. Uh, thank you to Usma and Mahin and Cliff for hosting me for lunch. Uh, thank you to Google. Uh, this, you want to talk about legend. This company is legend. This campus is legend. And I was uh, joking with Usma and Mahin and, and Cliff earlier saying, you know, I've, I've long wanted to visit Google, but I felt a little peculiar about being a tourist here. So when I got the, the invitation to come speak, I thought, well, you know, this is, this is my opportunity to kind of get an oogle at Google, if you will, and see the famous pool tables and the coffee shops and uh, uh, the cafeterias and, and the tents. And uh, thank you. Thank you for, in, for being part of a generation that envisioned a new world and then built that world. And that's what we're trying to do in our own way at the Interfaith Youth Corps. And I wanna, what I want to describe for you is, is where that vision came from, what that vision is, and how we're trying to build it. And then what I'd love is your advice. I mean, your advice as a community of people who, as I said, have imagined a new world and then built that new world, right? How, how could you uh, counsel us in dramatically expanding our reach and our impact. So um, to begin with, I want to take you back to a place that Cliff and I happen to share, which is the University of Illinois. And I understand that there's a pretty good pipeline from Champaign-Urbana, Il uh, Illinois, to uh, Mountain View, California, a set of very, very talented computer engineers who are working here at Google. And I want to tell you that, that my year in uh, my my time in Champaign was a dramatic paradigm shift for me, right? My and and the paradigm shift was largely around issues of identity and diversity, right? I grew up as a as a person of color in in Indian American uh, who's Muslim in the suburbs of Chicago, and you know, frankly, I, I, I spent a lot of time trying to be white uh, in the western suburbs of Chicago because that's was kind of a, a the dominant cultural archetype. And when I got to the University of Illinois, I became part of a conversation about what does it mean to build a truly multicultural America, where people are proud of their racial, their ethnic, uh, their national backgrounds, and where they're contributing the best of those backgrounds to build this, this nation that has gathered people from the four corners of the earth. Right? The multicultural conversation was very, very prominent in the mid-1990s uh, at all over the country, and, and including the University of Illinois. And like any good 17-year-old first-year student, I would go home to my parents' house in Glen Ellen, and I would regale my father with all my newfound wisdom from my first year in college. And I would lecture him over and over again about identity and diversity, and my dad would kind of roll his eyes and be like, you know, I 
got my MBA from Notre Dame University in South Bend, Indiana, and I was one of the first Indian Americans in a senior position in corporate advertising. You think I don't know something about diversity? <laughs> and you think I don't know something about trying to advance multiculturalism? Uh, my dad said one thing to me, which not only struck me deeply at that point, but frankly changed my life. And he said, for all your talk about identity and diversity, Ibu, you never mention the form of identity and the type of diversity that's driving global politics, and that's religion. And my dad was exactly right. right. Think about 93, 94, 95, 96, that mid to late 1990s. Think about some of the most prominent global events during that time. There was the World Trade Center bombing in 1993, kind of Al-Qaeda's coming out party, if you will. There was the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin in the Middle East. There was the possibilities represented by the Oslo process and then the breakdown of that process. There was a nuclear test in India, dubbed the Hindu bomb. There was the response in Pakistan, dubbed the Muslim bomb. There was a, a terrible rampage through uh, uh, Champaign, Illinois, and Chicago, and Bloomington, Indiana, uh, somebody who shot and targeted Jews, Asian Americans, and African Americans. Right? And each of those incidents of horror, you know, an, an, an additional one is um, the bombing at the Atlanta Olympics in 1996. Each of those incidents of horror was perpetrated to the soundtrack of prayer, was committed in the name of God, right? And what's interesting is that the perpetrators came from different religions. So Al-Qaeda clearly claims Muslim heritage. Uh, the assassin of Yitzhak Rabin in 1995 was Jewish, claims Jewish heritage. Um, the person who shot uh, Jews, African Americans, and Asian Americans in, in the Midwest was part of the Christian identity movement, right? So a huge part of national and global politics was this emergence of religious extremism. And Sam Huntington, the late Harvard political scientist, put a framework on this. For my money, a very dangerous framework. He said that the next era in human history was gonna be defined by what he called the clash of civilizations. The simple definition of the clash of civilizations is that people from different religious backgrounds were inherently and inevitably at odds with each other. Right? We were going to enter a period of inter-religious war. So his message to people from different religions is, a is essentially the people from the other faith are coming, sharpen your swords. Right? You have to, if, 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 if you don't want to die, you have to, you have to prepare to defeat and kill and win. Right? That's the message of the clash of civilizations. And my dad was exactly right. There was almost no discussion of this on my college campus. And Diana Eck, a professor at Harvard who writes on religious diversity, actually pointed out that there was almost no discussion of religion in the diversity or multicultural conversation nationally. She says religion is the missing R in the diversity conversation. And not only was this missing in kind of a global macro way, it was also missing in a personal way. And there's something that happened uh, um, when I was a resident advisor at the University of Illinois that I, I still remember. <clears throat> so again, this is in the midst of the multicultural movement where, where we are often invited to share our identities and to talk about how we might have met, been made to feel uncomfortable because of a certain part of our identity. So we're having this type of workshop as a group of resident advisors at the University of Illinois. And people are saying, well, you know, as an African American, you know, this happened to me as a Latino American, this happened to me that made me feel uncomfortable or marginalized. So it gets around to my friend Kizer. And Kizer says, you know, there was something that happened in the cafeteria a couple weeks ago that made me feel really uncomfortable. Uh, there was a group of students who basically had a food fight and who kept on getting food and throwing it around and, and everybody, including the resident advisors and the cafeteria workers, they were all laughing and effectively encouraging this terrible waste of food. And Kizer said, you know, for me, food is life, and life is from God, and that is precious because I'm a Muslim, and so I was a little bit offended by what happened. As I looked around at the faces of these resident advisors and these other kind of campus leaders at the University of Illinois, 
people who are you know trained to be aware of how people's identities affect their lives blank stares they weren't opposed to what Kizer was saying they just had no radar screen for it they had no radar screen for somebody making salient their religious identity and the role it played in their lives and I thought to myself wow you know we're missing a great opportunity here right because at the global political level the story that's being written is a story of religions in conflict with each other and who seemed to be the perpetrators of that conflict who who were the foot soldiers of religious extremism they're always teenagers and 20 somethings right I mean the assassin of Yitzhak Rabin is 26 years old almost all of the September 11th hijackers in their 20s right Osama bin Laden recruited into extremism when he's 14 years old right the person who bombs uh, the Atlanta Olympics part of the Christian identity movement is just 30 years old right religious extremism is a movement of young people taking action well here was this other movement happening on college campuses of young people who wanted to be aware in an appreciative way of identities that mattered to people and to bring those identities into harmony and cooperation. But we weren't talking about religion. We were forfeiting that territory to the religious extremists of the world. I thought to myself, you know, we, we ought to be able to do something different. We ought to be able to do something different. And, and one of the things that gave me an awful lot of encouragement and inspiration is history. You know, so much of the 20th century's most inspiring movements are actually interfaith movements started by young people. So Martin Luther King Jr. is obviously a great civil rights hero. He's a great African-American hero. He's a great American figure. But he's also a great interfaith hero. You know, King, after all, was inspired by Gandhi's movement in in India. He marched in Selma with Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. He carried on a correspondence that deeply influenced him by a Buddhist monk named the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh. Right? King learns from people from a variety of religious backgrounds, even as he remains deeply, deeply rooted in his own Christian faith, and he learns how to bring people from different religions together to serve the common good. The Civil Rights Movement is an interfaith movement. Same with Gandhi's Hind Swaraj movement in India. Same with the struggle in South Africa, right? Same with movements uh, um, like community organizing. These are interfaith movements. And so I think to myself, if those were movements that were built in the early and mid and late part of the 20th centuries, couldn't we be part of writing the next chapter in interfaith cooperation, especially in an era of global religious conflict? final inspiring dimension from history. The people who started those interfaith movements, they're our age, younger, right? King in Montgomery in 1955 when he led the bus boycott is 26 years old. Mandela when he founds the Youth League of the African National Congress, 26 years old. Gandhi when he starts the movement against the racist pass laws of South Africa in the early 20th century, 24 years old. The Dalai Lama, when he moves Tibetans into India, 24 years old, right? Well, if interfaith cooperation in previous eras was a movement of young people, why not today? Why can't we make the story of young people's involvement in religious diversity in the 21st century not a story of the clash of civilizations, but a story of interfaith cooperation, right? I think religion in the 21st century can go one of four basic directions. It can be a bubble of isolation. It can say that your religious commitment or your, your humanist commitment, whatever it might be, walls you off from everybody different. And if you're a Muslim, you can't talk to anybody else. If you're a Hindu or a Christian or a humanist, you can't have any dealings with anybody else from a different background. So it can be a bubble. It can be a barrier of division. And your religion is so different from anybody else's that you're actually in an oppositional tension. It can be a bomb of destruction. You know, you feel like you need to dominate people from other backgrounds violently. Or it can be a bridge of cooperation. Right? The 21st century could lift up the best of the spirit of the civil rights movement, 
the best of the spirit of the, South, the, the struggle in South Africa, the best of the spirit of the settlement house movement in the United States, and say that people from different religious backgrounds, including no religion at all, ought to interact in ways that build understanding and cooperation. We ought to be building bridges. Right? I think that there are four main trends in the world that make this one of the great topics of our times. Right? Trend number one is we're living during a time of a religious revival. You know, the best sociologists 40 years ago, people like Peter Berger, many, many others, were saying that you know, religion is dead. As societies modernize, they secularize necessarily. Right? Well, a lot of those sociologists, in light of you know, recent movements and trends and demographics, say that they made what Berger calls a category mistake. Modernity doesn't so much secularize as it pluralizes. Right? And indeed, what numbers show right now is that there's, a, there's religion, as Peter Berger says, the world is as religious as it ever was, perhaps more furiously religious than ever. Right? Sure, there's a growth in people who call themselves non-believers, but there's increased fervence in a particular set of believers, especially in areas of the world defined by the second trend. The second trend is the youth bulge. We live in a very, very young world. You at Google are probably hyper aware of this because a lot of so many people who are fast adopters of new Google technologies and approaches are very young people because they're, they're the first ones who kind of, you know, they don't have to go from a landline to a cell phone. They just go straight to a cell phone. And then whatever the next technology is that you guys are, are, are developing here. Uh, let me give you some stats on this. The median age in Iraq is 19.5. The median age in Afghanistan is 17.6. There are more children in India than there are citizens of the United States. And none of those places is the youngest place on the planet. That uh, award goes to Uganda. Right? How are all these young people going to view their identities in an era of religious revival? Are they going to view them, those identities, as bubbles, as bombs, as barriers, or as bridges? third trend that I want to make salient is the breakdown of traditional socioeconomic patterns. Very simply, for much of human history, people have expected to live the type of life, have the kind of job, have the kind of family, have the kind of socioeconomic pattern, if you will, that their parents had, right? Well, those jobs don't exist anymore. From, you know, Kansas City to Cairo to Cape Town. Right? And if the same jobs don't exist, then you can't build a family structure on top of those jobs. Right? You're, you're seeing entire socioeconomic patterns, entire waves of ways of life disappear. And what that does is make identity questions, who am I questions, that much more acute, that much sharper. Right? Because you no longer have the same kind of identity in being a, a worker at uh, uh, um, a GM factory or being a worker at a government office in Cairo. So you're constantly saying, who am I and what type of pattern, what life pattern am I expected to live? The fourth trend, another type of, another thing you guys are hyper aware of here at Google, and in fact, a trend that you have dramatically accelerated, is the increase in interaction by people from different backgrounds. Okay, so just about everybody on earth right now is aware that there are people who are very different than them on earth. And think about how shocking that is. If you weren't aware, if, if, if you thought that the whole world went to church on Sunday, right? your entire town of 700 people goes to church on Sunday, and then one person moves into your town who doesn't go to church. Right? Or you're aware of somebody on the other side of the world because of some Google application that puts you in touch with that person, of somebody who prays very differently or doesn't pray at all, doesn't believe in God at all, or believes in, a, in one God fervently, or believes that Jesus is the Son of God when you believe Jesus is a prophet of God. Right? You start asking yourself two deep gut-level questions. Question number one, if that person believes something differently, why do I believe what I believe? If the Buddhist kid who just moved into my town doesn't go to church on Sunday, why do I go to church on Sunday? Now, what you took for granted because it was your whole world before, because 
you know, all you knew as a fish was water, right? When somebody shows you air, you start to ask yourself the question, why do I live in water? And the second question it makes salient is, how do I relate to that person? So she doesn't go to church on Sunday. He doesn't pray the way that I do. She doesn't believe in God at all. So what does that mean for how we relate to each other, right? So think of the intersection of these four trends, the religious revival, the youth bulge, the breakdown in traditional socioeconomic patterns, and the increase in interaction of people from different backgrounds. And if you will, personify them for a moment. Think of the 17-year-old kid in Cairo or the 17-year-old kid in a favela outside of Rio or in a township out of Johannesburg or in a small town in Nebraska, right? And think of the number of 17-year-old kids around the world who can't live the life that their mom or dad lived, right? Who are asking themselves all sorts of who am I questions and are now asking not only what does it mean to be a Pentecostal in Brazil or a Catholic in Nebraska or a Muslim in Cairo or a Hindu in India, but what does it mean to be one of those people in a world of Pentecostal, of Brazilian Pentecostals, Israeli Jews, Indian Hindus, American Catholics, right? Who am I in this world? How do I relate to those people? There is an enormous energy at the intersection of those four trends. And the thing that scares me is the people who figured that energy out first are religious extremist movements. Right? I view extremist movements from Al-Qaeda to the Christian identity movement to their equivalents in every faith, and they have equivalents in every faith. I view them as effectively youth movements. They are movements that understand the psychology of 16 to 24 year olds, understand the confusion and power and search for clarity and impact that is at the heart of what it means to be at that intersection. These movements have a clear message to those young people. Your religious civilization was once a magnificent people. And look at us now. We are in the gutter. We're suffering. But you can return us to glory. All you need to do is dominate those other people. Right? These religious extremist movements recruit, train, network, mobilize young people to be the foot soldiers of religious extremism. That's why on the evening news tonight and tomorrow night and the next night, you're going to see some story of some young person killing other people to the soundtrack of prayer. It's no accident that they're young. They were recruited young. They were trained young. They were mobilized young. The Interfaith Youth Corps is a movement that wants to turn the tide. We want to change the story. We see a movement of young people taking up the mantle of King and Jane Addams and Dorothy Day and Mother Teresa and Abraham Joshua Heschel and Nelson Mandela, a movement of young people who believes in a world of pluralism who believes in a world where people from different backgrounds live in equal dignity and mutual loyalty. A world where people's identities are respected, a world where there are positive relationships between people of different communities, and a world where those people are coming together to serve the common good. We call that a world of pluralism. That's the world that we're trying to build, right? We would like interfaith cooperation to be a social norm. In the same way that environmentalism has become a social norm, in the same way that service learning has become a social norm, in the same way that hu the human rights movement is a social norm. When you walk out onto the street, the Google campus is a, is a unique chakra of the world, so let's not use you guys as the, as the test case here. But uh, let's say you were to walk um, some miles in any direction. You tap somebody on the shoulder and say, human rights movement. They would know what you were talking about. Environmentalism. They would know what you were talking about. They would say, yeah, that's a good thing. The earth is precious and it ought to be protected. And you know, I recycle and I drive a hybrid car and we compost at my home. I participate in this thing. What would it look like for interfaith cooperation to have the same clarity of definition? 
to have the same participatory culture where you walk out in the street in 10 or 15 years and tap somebody on the shoulder and say, interfaith cooperation. And the person says, yeah, you know, people from different religious backgrounds, including no religion at all, they ought to be coming together in ways that build understanding and cooperation. That's the definition of interfaith cooperation. And, and I'm a part of that. You know how I'm a part of it? Because I, I have a knowledge base of, of how different religions speak to service, right? So I don't get my, my information on Islam from the evening news. I don't get my information on Judaism or Hinduism or evangelical Christianity from the evening news. I have an appreciative knowledge of the world's religions, including humanism, right? I, uh, my church or synagogue or mosque, we're part of a congregational exchange, right? My 15-year-old son or daughter, he or she participates in Interfaith Habitat for Humanity builds four times a year as part of the youth group of our temple. The college campus that my 19-year-old daughter is on, she's the leader of the Interfaith Student Council. The mayor of Mountain View or the mayor of Palo Alto or the mayor of Chicago, they hosted their eighth annual Day of Interfaith service, and this year it had 8,000 people, right? That's the kind of texture that I'm talking about for interfaith cooperation being a social norm. It means people have a framework of what it means to build interfaith cooperation. It means they have a knowledge base of how different religions speak to service and what it is in their own tradition that would inspire them to cooperate with others. And they have a skill set. They have the ability to bring people from different religious backgrounds together to build understanding and cooperation. That's interfaith cooperation becoming a social norm. We think that, there, that, that we could advance three core strategies against this. Obviously, in, in any movement that becomes a social norm, there are a thousand organizations. There are a million different niches, right? Environmentalism has you know, people who chain themselves to redwood trees and people who buy hybrid cars and people who uh, start recycling programs in elementary schools and people who give money to the Sierra Club, right? There are a million riffs on environmentalism, but everybody knows that at the end of the day, what they're about is the earth is precious and it ought to be protected, right? For interfaith cooperation to become a social norm, it has to be a field and a movement that's as diverse and large and robust as, as any other movement, as environmentalism or human rights or civil rights or service learning. We would like to advance three key strategies. Key strategy number one, we need to spread a message and shape a discourse around interfaith cooperation. Part of what I woke up and realized a couple years ago is every night Al-Qaeda advertises religion is violent on the evening news for free. Okay? If you want a commercial, if you're a toothpaste company or a cola company or a car company and you want to get your message out on MSNBC or CNN or NBC, you got to pay $50,000 for 30 seconds or $200,000 for 30 seconds. But if you're a religious extremist group, all you have to do is videotape your beheading and send the videotape to a media company. And the media company plays it for free. And what that effectively is, is an advertisement for religion is violent. So what that means is there's a lot of people who walk around the world and all they know about religion, period, or somebody else's religion is that videotape. And I think that that's terrible, right? What does it look like for those of us who believe in interfaith cooperation, right, who believe that religion can be a bridge of positive cooperation to be as aggressive as strategic about advancing our message of interfaith cooperation, of religion as a bridge through media and policy circles. Right? What does it mean for us to, to shape a discourse that, that says that religions, although they have clear doctrinal differences, also have very important shared values? Show me a religion that doesn't value mercy. Show me a religion that doesn't value compassion hospitality, service, right? The message that we have to send is that religious communities can come together on these shared values. Those values are mutually enriching and they are actionable. And that ought to be part of the character of the next era. We cannot forfeit the, the space of the media or the policy to people who believe in the clash of civilizations. We have to make sure that that space is imbued with the message of interfaith cooperation. Strategy number two, we believe a sector needs to show what good looks like. You know, one of the things that I love about Google is that in so many ways, 
this is a company that shows what good looks like, how it should treat its employees, right? And so many other companies have had to follow the lead of Google to the benefit of the workforce around the country and the world. We think that college campuses can show what good looks like when it comes to interfaith cooperation. Just like college campuses did it around multiculturalism and sensitized people to the importance of, of ethnic and racial and national identity and sought to build a culture where people from different racial and ethnic and national backgrounds were coming together in a spirit of cooperation, college campuses are places where there are different religious student groups, where there's a volunteer office, where there's an ethos of leadership development, where there is a, a sense of being on the vanguard. Why shouldn't every college campus consider it part of its mission to model interfaith cooperation? Every college campus has days of interfaith service. College presidents give inaugural speeches to the freshman class about the importance of religious diversity and engaging it positively. Uh, there are academic courses that builds people's knowledge base and skill set in interfaith cooperation. Orientation leaders, RAs, are trained in religious diversity and interfaith cooperation. Right? College campuses can show what good looks like. And that has, there are two clear benefits to that. One is it's a sector that other people follow. Right? I'm pretty convinced that if college campuses show what good looks like, the corporate sector will follow. High schools will follow. Uh, municipalities will follow. Right? Higher education likes to serve as the vanguard. I think they ought to serve as the vanguard in this area. The second thing is that higher education trains a nation's next generation of leaders. So if you have a generation of leaders who are imbued with the importance of interfaith cooperation, who develop some of the knowledge base, who acquire the skill set of interfaith cooperation, not only do they have a chance to practice that on their campuses, but they go ahead and bring that into the culture when they graduate and they take it to their neighborhoods and to their communities and to their companies. They become interfaith leaders. And that's the third part of the interfaith youth course strategy. We need, just like the envir environmental movement has a, a critical mass of people called environmentalists who are driving it, and the human rights movement has a critical mass of people called human rights activists, for interfaith cooperation to become a social norm, we need to have a critical mass of people who are called interfaith leaders. We need to have an identity category that people can, I, that people can relate to, consider themselves a part of, be in a community within, and that identity category says it's our job to advance this ethos, this quality across the planet. One of the most important movements of the past 25 years has been social entrepreneurship. One of the most important dimensions of that movement is simply the identity category title social entrepreneur, right? You have a bunch of people around planet Earth who say, hey, I'm a person who dreams new dreams for the social sector, for how the world can be better, and I put those dreams into action. That means I'm a social entrepreneur. That means I'm in this community of people called social entrepreneurs, right? We need a community of people called interfaith leaders, and there needs to be enough of them in neighborhoods and on campuses and in companies across the world to help make interfaith cooperation a social norm. Okay. So here is where I would love the help of Googlers. Why it, it strikes me that so much religious extremist messaging and recruitment takes place online, right? This is where so many young people especially develop their identity of religion as a barrier or as even a bomb. How do we use the online space to send the message and build a community of religion as a force for interfaith bridge building? That's what part of what I'd like to focus the discussion on, but before I go into that, I wanna leave you with, with uh, a piece of one of my favorite poems um, by William Stafford, a great poet of the West Coast uh, Native American poet, and he says in this, in this beautiful poem called A Ritual to Read to Each Other, if you don't take the time to get to know me, and I don't take the time to get to know you, then a pattern that others made may prevail in this world, and following the wrong God home, we could miss our star. 
those who are awake must be awake now, or else a falling line will lull us back to sleep. The signals we give, yes or no or maybe, must be clear now, because the darkness around us is deep. Thank you for having me at Google. I look forward to the conversation. Jazakallah Akhar. So we do we do have the the mic if if people um, have any any questions to go for it. Well, I guess uh, I guess one one question that I had uh, is in terms of of really making um, making people aware beyond the college campus. How how like what what concrete steps should people take when they you know move to a, a corporate America where the atmosphere right. is is different? Or you know, like people in their middle age mm -hmm. or senior citizens, how how can we continue the, in the interfaith dialogue um, right. well, in later in years? Cliff, let me let me let me ask, uh, let me let me respond to that in two ways. Number one, I think one of the best ways, obviously, of getting spreading the message is is through communications and media. And what I would love your advice on is, what does it look like to create online platforms to this kind of civic goal of interfaith cooperation. And one of the things that strikes me is, as I was sharing with you at lunch, is you know, I write a blog for the Washington Post called The Faith Divide, and I write for USA Today uh, uh, with some frequency and the Sunday Times of India, and I, I write for the Huffington Post, and, and the vast majority of the comments on those articles and blogs are hateful, right? And, and they're just, I mean, there's, they, they range between um, Islam is evil and religions are fated to fight. And I, I think to myself, th that can't be representative of the vast majority of people, right? Because you, you don't necessarily see that poison in direct human discourse. And clearly there are things about the online world which make it easier because of anonymity for people to say terrible things they might not say to somebody's face. But how would the smartest people in the online space, think about spreading a message and creating an online community of people who believe in interfaith cooperation, given my very real experience of people responding to, you know, frankly, uh, um, non-controversial pieces uh, about the importance of interfaith cooperation. I don't, I don't, you know, my job is not to take controversial policy stance, it's just to hold up the idea that religion can be a bridge of cooperation. And, what people say about that, like I said, is it's it's unbelievable. So that's one way of spreading this. Let me let me give a more direct answer to your question, which is, you know, just like I think uh, um, college campuses are a great place to do interfaith service projects. You have twelve thousand people here at your Google campus in Mountain View, right? Do an interfaith service project amongst Googlers and and have it be open to people who who are Muslim and Jewish and Evangelical and Catholic and Hindu and Buddhist and humanist and say. Part of what it means to have an interfaith service project is not just to gather the organic diversity of Google together to, to clean rivers and tutor children, but to have, an, uh, to have a facilitated discussion. This is what we do. We train these facilitators, have a facilitated discussion about how people's various faith identities and religious traditions inspire them to do service. So effectively, you're using a service project as an opportunity to have a discussion about how religion is a bridge of cooperation on the shared value and the and the and the pragmatic action project of serving others right i think you can do that in a city i think you can do that on a campus i think you can do that at google and i hope you do um, i've read your book oh thank you and uh uh, in fact, a whole group of people through my church uh, read it. Uh, we read it. We have a an ongoing discussion group called God's Politics, inspired oh. by uh, Jim Sojourner, Wallace, Jim Wallace, and Sojourners. Um, and I grew up in the Midwest, so I relate somewhat to your. Uh, the book says about. Um, I grew up in a much more non-diverse community, a little town. Um, one of the things I see that with my son's generation is that they are seeing religion as a very divisive issue. And they yeah. say, heck with it. Uh, all it does is make people angry. All it does is make people fight. All it does is kill people. So um, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And so to bring up anything about religion, even with my boys who went to church but don't want to now, 
is, um, is divisive to even mention that idea. So I'm, I'm not sure it's the big uh, atheist movements like Richard Dawkins and the people who are um, so strong against religion are the problem, but the people who are just sort of seeing religion as not a force for good, but a force right. for, for right. Um, destruction. Right. So you know, th thank you for that, that comment. Um, you know, I, I actually have many more Bs than the four that I, I listed. You know, so I listed religion as a bubble, as a barrier, as a bomb, and as a bridge. I think the fourth one, and an increasingly prevalent one, is religion as blasé, right? And people who just don't want to have anything to do with it. And I think that that is one of the consequences of, of religious violence playing out in the evening news. And it's one of the consequences of people from other faiths denouncing people of different faiths. And I think that in a way, any of us who are religious or anybody who has a friend who's religious, right, who ha is, has an appreciation of, that f of, of how precious that identity is to that friend, to say, gosh, you know, it's, it's wrong and damaging and false to only have the story of religion as poison and violence out there. You would not have had a civil rights movement if you didn't have the religious inspiration to power the Montgomery bus boycott. They met in churches, they sang, they sang gospel songs together, they called it a movement of Christian love. King said Jesus furnished the inspiration and Gandhi, a religious Hindu, gave us the message. I saw Nelson Mandela speak in Cape Town in 1999 and he said, I would not be standing here today if it wasn't for Christians and Muslims and Hindus and Jews and traditionalists in Africa coming together to build a struggle against apartheid, right? So I just think it is, it is a terribly sad thing if this generation passes on to the next generation that religion can only poison things and therefore you shouldn't touch it at all. What we ought to be passing on is religion can be a real force for good, but you have to make it a force for good, right? And in order for you to make it a force for good, you can't forfeit it into the hands of bad people. That's a big part of the message of the Interfaith Youth Corps is to, is to lift up that message and to empower young people who want to believe in religion as a force for good in their own lives, in history, in the lives of their friends, to make it so. Um, so, there have been recent talks about building a mosque at Ground Zero in New York, mm -hmm. and I've read in the news that there have been protests um, where people have essentially gone with signs that say stuff like, building a mosque at Ground Zero spits on the graves of 9-11 victims. Um, so, to that end, what do you think the residents of New York could do to right. build bridges? Right. I think So, I think that's a great question. So. Um, let me, let me offer a story and then platform off that story into a more direct response to this. So when Keith Ellison, uh, was a friend of mine and the first Muslim to get elected to Congress in American history from the 5th District in Minnesota representing Minneapolis, uh, when people started to, uh, when, when, when some people said, we shouldn't have a Muslim in Congress, and we definitely shouldn't let him take his oath of office on the Quran. Keith Ellison's response was to walk across the street to the Library of Congress and to request the Quran reverently owned by the Honorable Thomas Jefferson and to take his oath of office on that Quran. Right? And the message he was sending is that religious diversity and interfaith cooperation was part of the founding ideals of this country. And by suggesting that there shouldn't be a Muslim elected to Congress or that I shouldn't take my oath of office in the Quran is actually violating a core American value. So I don't want to call you just an Islamophobe. I want to call you somebody who is advancing a message that's anti-American, right? You know, George Washington carried on a correspondence with the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, and this 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 Jewish leader sent him a letter saying, in, in this new country called America, are my people safe here? And Washington says, this nation will give bigotry no sanction, right? That's, 
as American an ethic as you have, that, that diversity ought to flourish and, and ought to become cooperation. And I think that that's the message that not just the Muslims of New York, but that the people of New York ought to bring to the people who are violating that message. That you're being, by, by saying that a group of people cannot build a house of prayer here, you're violating the ethic of Washington, you're violating the ethic of Jefferson, you're violating the eth ethic of Madison and Franklin, and those people who built this nation. And you don't know anything about Islam. But that's point number two. I'm at Google. I have all the time in the world. <laughs> um, w one of the big concerns that uh, I have about, uh, I'm sorry, how do I say this? Most religions have at their core an exclusivism. I've read the Bible. I haven't read the Quran, but I've read other religious uh, writings. And so many of them have, at least as part of it, saying, we are the good people. Everybody else is the bad people. Maybe they said that 2,000 years ago, but um, in Islam, I don't know, but in, in the Bible, clearly it says in parts of Genesis, kill all the people who aren't, aren't Jews. And people use that all the time. How do we get the, uh, um, my own uh, religious um, group is Lutheranism. And there's a group of Lutherans who refuse to have anything to do mm -hmm. with people who are not their particular brand of Lutherans because even working with them together <coughs> is a sign that somehow they're sanctioning somebody else's belief as being mm -hmm. valid. And mm -hmm. how, do you, how, do, how does one get to people who have that mm -hmm. mindset that I'm right and everybody else is wrong? There, there are jokes about it, of course, right. but it's serious. And I, think, mm -hmm. and I think it's so easy for people to fall into it. How do you, right. how do you start opening up dialogue with people who start from there? Right. So let me, let me tell you a story. Um, it's a great story about uh, a Christian pastor who is an American who is stationed in Europe during World War II and his congregation sends him money so that he can make the voyage back to America to spend Christmas with his family and his, his church community. And he uses that money to help a group of Jews flee from Hitler's fires into safety. And one of his congregants writes and says, but they weren't even Christian. And he writes back and says, yes, but I am, right? And what strikes me about that is, is here is somebody who says, at the heart of my faith is standing up for people from a different faith. And you know what? That's a theology. That's not just that guy was a nice guy. That's the Good Samaritan story, right? That's Jesus reaching out to the marginalized. And so where I would begin is not so much arguing point-counterpoint with people who have what I would call a theology of separation or a theology of domination. I would just lift up the theology of interfaith cooperation. And I would say, look, there are parts of the Christian, of the Christian scripture and moments of Christian history that clearly sacralize make holy cooperating with people from different religions. Those are the parts that I, I relate to and want to make real. That's not to say that there aren't other parts, but you know, the Bible is a big book. You know, Muslim history is 1,400 years long, right? There are clearly contradictory dimensions to, to both scripture and to the history of a religious tradition. And at the end of the day, adherents of different traditions, whether it's Hinduism or humanism, choose which parts of that tradition that they're going to emphasize and that they're going to be inspired by, right? Um, Hala Dabu al Fadl, great Muslim theologian, uh, Usma was talking about earlier, actually, you know, he writes a beautiful essay on this called The Place of Tolerance in Islam, where he says, you know, here are the scriptures, here are, here are the parts of Muslim scripture and the places in Muslim history that emphasize domination. Right? And then he says, here are the parts of scripture and the places in Muslim history which emphasize cooperation. Right? And then he says, so how do you choose which one is more important? And he goes through you know, a set of kind of uh, um, more technical uh, 
uh, theological approaches which say, you know, there are certain verses which are de-emphasized because they're historically bounded in other verses which are considered uh, uh, eternal, etc. But then at the end of the essay, he says something that's so powerful to me. He says, you know what? At the end of the day, the Quran will morally enrich the reader to the extent that the reader morally enriches the Quran, right? At the end of the day, God has written kindness in the human heart, and the human heart is meant to approach a religious tradition in the spirit of kindness. That's what Halad Abu al-Fadl is saying. He says, that's Muslim theology, right? It comes from Surah 2 of the Holy Quran, in which God says that he created Muslims, uh, he created uh, humankind as his Abd and Halifa, his servant and representative on earth. God gave us his breath, his ruh. We tend towards the good, as the Muslim tradition says, and we act on those dimensions that we consider good in the scripture and in the tradition, right? So I, I don't want to get into, you know, a theological, like, you know, sword-wielding match with people who have a theology of domination. I would much rather lift up and make salient a theology of interfaith cooperation and, and say to people around the world, most of whom are good, right, I share that belief with, with Google that people are good. The more you lift up that positive theology, the more people will, will relate to it. And, and I think that, you know, to be a little bit sharp about this, I think we have failed to do that, right? I am always struck that people who believe in, 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 in the bubble, the barrier, or the bomb, they can quote chapter and verse on why they believe that. Bang, bang, bang. They have it at the tip of their tongue. But those of us who believe in the bridge, we, don't re we can't really cite. You know, Surah 49 of the Holy Quran says, God made us different nations and tribes that we may come to know one another, right? Uh, from from uh, uh, the constitution of Medina, right, where uh, the prophet Muhammad made the peace and blessings of God be upon him, created uh, a, a framework where people from different religious backgrounds would come together in one city in Medina through uh, the great Muslim empires of Cordoba and the Fatimids and Baghdad through Akbar and the Ottomans through what Rwandan Muslims did in the genocide. You know, the Muslim communities have often built partnerships and in fact stood up for people who are different from them. That's what I want to act on, right? And it's the same in Judaism, it's the same in, in Christianity, it's the same in Hinduism, it's the same in humanism. Lifting that up, teaching that theology, I think that, uh, that, that that ought to be a high priority. Hi, I just want to say thanks. It's a great uh, subject and a good discussion to have. Um, I was a member of an interfaith group in college, so I want to thank you for supporting the movement. Um, but one problem we had, or that I observed in our small group, was we had a lot of people from different faiths, but we didn't have anyone, like you said, from like the humanist movement or mm -hmm. people without um, a religiously defined faith. Mm -hmm. So how do we make sure that we reach out to um, those groups who don't necessarily have a religion and make sure they're not turned off yeah. by the mention of faith? I think that's a great question. Thank you, thank you for that. So I, I think part of it is language, and, and, and you know I've gotten better at this, um, and, and so I, I include humanism. I it's not a religious tradition, but it is indeed a tradition, right? And it's a tradition that uh, has has books and heroes and and inspiration for people to cooperate and serve. And so just including that in our language, I think, is important. Um, there are leaders of the humanist movement, like my friend Greg Epstein, who's the humanist chaplain at Harvard, who you ought to invite to speak here, uh, who has written a book called Good Without God, where he talks about how humanists ought to be involved in interfaith cooperation and interfaith service, right? So use of language is important, issuing the invitation to humanists is important, and finding the leaders of the humanist movement who are pushing interfaith cooperation as a priority, those are three ways to do that. Thank you. Nobody's giving me advice on how to build an interfaith movement online. I don't know how to build an uh, interfaith Aren't you Googlers supposed to be problem but, solvers? But I, I actually had one thing, and I, I, I don't want, I hope by the name it doesn't sound like degrading. I don't know too much about it, but I'm in NJDU department, um, and someone that I don't work directly with but is also in that department. Um, 
recently went to a fairly major conference in New York called, I don't know what it's called, but it was regarding something called serious games. And he mentioned that with these things called serious games, which are somewhat like education games, but less, the education is less directly in your face, is a little more appealing, I guess, to kids, a little more yeah. playing than, you know, kind of a fake setup and they say this is a game, but it's actually a math problem, right? Um, but he's, he mentioned that there's people, you know, from all different subjects and movements and a lot of social activists and different things doing with ideas in the realm of, of, um, of what they're calling serious games. And I don't, I don't, I don't build platforms, but <laughs> that's just something that struck me as you were talking. And I, I've been trying to think for the last five minutes of the name of forgotten it, but something in this serious games that uh, took place, um, I think largely in the San Francisco Bay Area, but with environmentalism in which people, um, I don't know, I watched a YouTube video on it, but they, they pretty much, it was like a real life game and they took, they took, um, they pretty much videotaped themselves, put it on YouTube through the game, I can't remember the name of, um, uh, when they were, you know, of different actions they were taking to help the environment and it was kind of made into a game with people across the city playing this game for environmentalism. I don't know, you know, it'd have to be. I, I love that. I mean, this is I think actually exactly the kind of, the kind of uh, uh, advice I'm looking for is, mm -hmm. is part of what you have to do in, in the online space is mm -hmm. things like figure out where young people already are and how you can weave messages like interfaith cooperation into things that they're already involved with. So I, I love to hear that environmentalism is being woven into games, and I think right. you could do the same with interfaith cooperation, right? right? Like so, so you could be an interfaith leader online and and kind of mimic talking to the leader of a synagogue about how to get their synagogue involved in an interfaith project, right? I mean mm -hmm. that that could be an online kind of interaction. So right. thank you for that. I think it's a great great suggestion. Sure. So yeah, it's called Serious Games, and there's um, some other some other things related, but that's the name that jumps out at me. Um, the other thing is that I'm I'm here for the year, but really I'm a I'm a teacher most of the time, and I was just wondering what what kind of things are being done through your organization or or other similar ones, like more at, at the high school level, because I mean you can keep going down forever, yeah. but you know the high school students do go on to yeah. college, and I I know high school students who have started groups based on race and things like that. So are, are there things being done at high school? Yeah. So so. We don't do a ton of direct work with high schools. I mean, occasionally I'll be asked to like be the Martin Luther King Jr. Day speaker at a school, and and you know I'll, I'll do it if I can. I would clearly enjoy that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not afraid of the microphone, as you can see. <laughs> um, but part of building a movement, a part of a movement, is that different organizations emerge and kind of drive different dimensions of work. And so I think. The, there, there should be national and international level orga interfaith organizations that focus on high schools. And at the end of the day, you know, our, our hope, the wonderful thing about college students is they become college graduates and then they go off and they take their message and knowledge base and skill set into whatever they do. And hopefully a lot of them become high school teachers. <laughs> okay. And cool. Yeah, and then maybe the last one is this is something that we're currently having a lot of trouble with our work on because we're doing things education, but um, other than online, just like if there's any way to get into curriculum, you know, yeah. I mean, then you, you hit everyone. Yeah. Now that's, that's kind of like this yeah. lost thing that's very difficult to change, but. Yeah. Well, we do that at the college level, right. you know, like is, is we help faculty shape new courses and in interfaith cooperation. I just finished teaching a course at Northwestern University called Interfaith Leadership, and we're trying to spread that course. Uh, so, and then again, we hope the theory of change is that campuses serve as a vanguard sector, and as they teach courses in interfaith cooperation, high schools start doing that. Right, right, true. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. Thank you so much.